On the morning of March 7, to the sound of sirens announcing Patton's arrival, a string of armoured cars and all-terrain vehicles drove into Jebel Kui and stopped in the muddy square near the school where the headquarters of the Second Corps was located. Even the Arabs who had been dragging themselves along the muddy streets picked up the hem of their clothes and began to scatter and hide in the nearest back alleys. The armoured cars were bristling with machine guns and the long antennas on the vehicles swayed violently from side to side. In the first car, like an ancient hero in a chariot, stood Patton himself. He was scowling against the wind, the strap of his steel helmet with two stars tight around his chin. Two large silver stars on a red plate were the insignia of his command vehicle. On either side of the hood were metal flags. One had two white stars on a red field, the other was engraved with the letter STEA, an acronym for the Western Task Force, which Patton commanded in the Casablanca area. The next day, the flag with the letters WTF was replaced by a new one with a blue and white colored shield, the identification of the Second Corps. Almost four months after landing in North Africa, Patton had not found a place on the coast of French Morocco, where his first armored corps was stationed, whose task was to discourage Franco from closing the narrow strait of Gibraltar and cut the vital Allied artery to the Mediterranean. This corps consisted of two divisions, the Second Armoured Division, which he had once commanded at Fort Benning, and the famed Third Infantry Division, when there was no longer any danger of Spanish intervention on the side of the Axis powers. Patton soon tired of guard duty on the frontier 1,600 kilometres from the front line. Although Patton was to leave the First Armoured Corps for another assignment, he jumped at Ike's offer to go to Tunisia. According to Eisenhower, Patton was to rejuvenate the Second Corps and infuse it with fighting spirit. On the third day after Patton's arrival, the Second Corps' headquarters were already engaged in a fierce battle, however, not with the Germans, but with their new commander. George decided to shake up the corps so that everyone would realise that the days of easy living were over. Instead of waiting for the divisions to realise that things would now go differently, Patton began to look for a means to bring this to the immediate consciousness of every soldier. He began with uniform regulations. After a few months at the front, the carelessness that British soldiers showed in wearing proper field uniforms was passed on to the Americans. There were increasing instances of soldiers and officers who were not under fire removing their heavy steel helmets and wearing only protective helmets. To Patton, these under-helmets were evidence of the laxity that prevailed in the Second Corps. The move against the under-helmets was his first reform in the corps. The blow was dealt by issuing an order mandating the mandatory wearing of helmets, gaiters, and ties in the corps area. Rear units were not exempt from wearing helmets, and even troops on the front lines were not allowed to remove their ties. To enforce the order, Patton established a uniform system of fines for violation. $50 for officers and $25 for soldiers. A hit on the pocketbook, George said, works best. Sometimes to emphasize the importance of following orders, Patton would go out himself to apprehend violators. He rarely returned from a day's ride without a collection of helmets confiscated from soldiers at the front. The campaign against helmets marked the beginning of Patton's reign in the Second Corps, when the slogan became, Spit and Brush. Every time a soldier tied his tie, laced his leggings, and buckled his heavy steel helmet, he was willy-nilly reminded that the Second Corps was commanded by Patton, that the Precasserine days were irrevocably gone, and that a new hard era had dawned. Most commanders would have made allowances for some individuals to wear a helmet, but for Patton there were no exceptions. The order was obeyed equally by nurses on duty in the hospital tents and mechanics working in the repair shops. When logistics officers once asked Patton if the order should apply to mechanics working on trucks, George cut him off. Damn right, you're right. Aren't they soldiers? Patton's second reform concerned the workings of the Second Corps' headquarters. During combat operations, staffs typically worked 12 to 16 hours a day, carving out time only to sleep and eat. Most headquarters officers sat up past midnight each night, processing the day's reports. Therefore, breakfast at the headquarters usually began at eight them, 30 min. In the morning, the point is that staff officers did not have much need to go to work earlier, as the first reports from the front came usually only after nine o'clock. These late breakfasts, however, were highly irritating to Patton, who regarded them as further proof of the laxity of the corpse. Good soldiers, Patton insisted, always get up before sunrise. A week after arriving in the corpse, Patton ordered the breakfast hour to be moved to an earlier hour, 
timed to coincide with dawn, while at the same time forbidding the officers to be served later than 6.30 a.m. 30 a.m. In themselves, these reforms were certainly trifling, but they did not fail to imprint Patton's character on the corpse. Although the reforms did not add to Patton's popularity, no one now doubted that Patton was the master of the corpse. Patton had replaced Fredendo, but I was still the fifth wheel in the cart. Formerly, I was attached to the corpse, but travelled to the front in accordance with a directive from Algiers. In Patton's eyes, this unusual assignment undermined the very foundations of command. If I was to be on his staff, Patton reasoned, then I must therefore be under his direct command. George had no dislike for me, but he was concerned about the independence I had been given in his corpse. I don't want those damned spies snooping around my headquarters. Patton growled fiercely to the Deputy Chief of Operations, Lieutenant Colonel Russell Akers, June. He immediately grabbed the phone and called Freedom, the code name for Eisenhower's Allied headquarters in Algeria. General Smith came to the phone. Listen, Bedell, Patton shouted. I want to talk to you regarding Bradley and his work here. The fact is, we're in desperate need of a good deputy corps commander. Bradley would be perfect for the job. If Ike says yes, I'll make Bradley my second in command. He'll help us and I want him to work with me. Is that okay with you? If so, talk to Ike. Smith put the question to Eisenhower, and when the latter agreed, he called me. So I became deputy commander of the second corps. This, however, did not mean that I ceased to be Eisenhower's informant. The week before at Tabessa, Eisenhower had remarked that he might make me Patton's deputy to gain combat experience in the South Tunisia campaign. However, I was to continue my observations and report directly to Algeria anything worthy of Ike's attention. After I officially became a member of the corps, Staff Patton offered to move with him to the mine superintendent's house inherited from Fredendall. Prior to that, I had lived between trips to the front with Hansen and Bridge in a small room on the second floor of a dirty mining company hotel. As I learned later, my move upset the officers of the Ranger Company, stationed at Jebel Kuif and carrying the headquarters guard Hansen and Bridge allowed them to use our beds during trips to the front. Almost as soon as our jeep left town, the trio of officers would rush to our room to sleep until our return in mattress beds. Patton's appointment as commander of the Second Corps entailed a promotion in rank. When Eisenhower reported that President Roosevelt had recommended to the Senate that Patton be promoted to Lieutenant General George's aide ceremoniously retrieved a flag with three stars and several sets of insignia. They were remarkably well prepared for such contingencies. Indeed, if Patton had been made Admiral of the Turkish Navy, for example, his adjutants would have dived into their bags and emerged with the appropriate insignia. I teased George, saying that the promotion wouldn't take effect until the Senate approved it. Nonsense, George grinned as he pinned on the new star. I've been waiting for that star. Patton had brought with him from the First Armoured Corps, the Chiefs of Intelligence, Operations and Logistics, not counting his Chief of Staff, Brigadier General Hugh Guffey. However, after familiarising himself with the Second Corps headquarters, he replaced only the Chief of Operations. Fred Endall's hand-picked Chiefs of Intelligence and Logistics remained in their posts under Patton, as they later did under me. The Chief of the Second Corps Intelligence Division was a tall, intelligent and temperamental officer, a former employee of the Philadelphia Railroad, Benjamin Dixon, nicknamed Monk. Dixon graduated from West Point in 1918, served in Siberia during World War Y, and then went into the reserves. In 1940, he was returned to the Army and assigned to the War Department's Intelligence Directorate. In March 1942, Dixon was appointed to the position of Assistant Chief of Intelligence, Second Corps Headquarters. Upon becoming Chief of the Intelligence Division, Dixon selected capable and diligent young officers for his department. Dixon's Chief of Counterintelligence, the quiet, perpetually pipe-toothed Professor of Anthropology, now Major Horace Minor, had parted with the native hut at Timbuku where he lived and crossed the Sahara to go to war. Another of Dixon's proteges was Lieutenant Crosby Lewis. The son of an Episcopal priest, he enlisted in the Canadian Army shortly after the war began in 1939. When the United States entered the war, Lewis immediately left his position as a senior clerk in the Black Guard and became a private in the U.S. Army in England. After the landing at Oran, Lewis distinguished himself in battle and was promoted to officer.
in Tunisia, Lieutenant Lewis, learned that Dixon needed to extract enemy orders to conduct troop reconnaissance under combat conditions. He smeared cobbler's ointment on his face and, accompanied by an Arab, set off across the front. A few days later, Lewis returned to Dixon with the information he needed. Monk gave Lewis a cephalopod for all and awarded him the Silver Star Medal. When Lewis attended Haverford College before the war, he organized a circle of veterans of future wars. One World War I veteran angrily denounced him for this as one of the Reds who will never fight for the fatherland. There was a later newspaper article about Lewis in connection with the award of the Silver Star, which he received from me for outstanding courage during an infantry attack across the mined bed of a dried up river in Sicily. He led this attack voluntarily and stormed a village on the opposite bank. The rear area division was headed by Robert Wilson. He, like Dixon, was a native of Philadelphia, but that was the end of their similarities. While Dixon was a linguist who prided himself on his reputation as a good storyteller, the unassuming Colonel Robert Wilson had the taciturnity of an ordinary businessman. He had served as an artilleryman during World War I and had been called up as a reserve officer for military service in June 1941. As chief of the home front, Wilson became famous during the Second Corps landing at Oran for his ability to resort to improvisation and overcome the many difficulties encountered during the landing. Later in Sicily and Normandy, I became accustomed to relying on the exceptional organizational skills of this remarkable but modest man. When dealing with complex supply issues at the highest level, I had no hesitation in considering him the best of all the rear area chiefs in the European theater. Another promising young officer in Dixon's employ was Captain Leonard Bessman. After graduating from the University of Wisconsin, Bessman enlisted as a volunteer in the Marine Corps in 1929 to enlist as a private in the Nicaragua campaign. In 1941, Bessman joined the army and was commissioned an officer. He was wounded and captured by the Germans during a reconnaissance organized by Dixon in Tunisia. In Italy, he managed to escape from a prisoner of war camp. Bessman spent six months with Italian partisans in the mountains before crossing the front line and returning to the Allies. In late February 1943, as Montgomery concentrated the Eighth Army for an offensive on the Marat Line, the Axis powers renewed their efforts to prevent Alexander and Montgomery's forces from joining forces. If this happened, then the Germans would be trapped in northeastern Tunisia, where the African continent comes closest to Sicily. In northern Tunisia, Arnim's tanks and dive bombers again struck at the British with the aim of upsetting the fighting order of Anderson's first army and cutting into its positions. On March 6, Rommel launched a desperate attack from the Marat line to delay the advance of Montgomery's army. Without reconnaissance and infantry support, Rommel hoped with the help of tanks. Alone, a swift blow to embrace and crush the flank of the British. The manoeuvre was soon thwarted by the fire of anti-tank artillery and the enemy retreated, leaving on the battlefield 52 tanks, thereby further weakening its reserve. The British did not lose a single tank in this battle. After the failure, sick and disappointed Rommel surrendered command of the Libyan troops and returned to Germany. When Rommel withdrew his tanks from the Marat line in February to strike at Kasserine Pass against Fedendal's corps, Alexander ordered Montgomery to launch a diversionary offensive. In this way, he hoped to force Rommel to quickly withdraw the troops intended for the offensive at Kasserine. Montgomery quickly carried out the order, and his army went on a false offensive. Rommel drove his tanks away from Taylor, the site of the Germans' greatest inroads, and hurriedly threw them back toward the Marit line. Alexander now realized that if he struck alternately, then on our front, then on Montgomery's front, he could force the enemy's tanks to rush all over southern Tunisia. For these reasons, he undertook a diversionary offensive of the Second Corps at El Guitar. By mid-March, the Axis forces were beginning to run out of steam in conducting deterrent counterattacks. The Allies had now achieved superiority over the Germans in both arms and resources. As Allied superiority became more and more evident, Arnim in the north and Messi in the south were forced to hand the initiative back to the Allies. Having seized the initiative, we could now strike at the enemy all the way to Tunisia. While Montgomery was preparing for a general offensive on the Merit Line, Alexander ordered the Second Corps to strike at the southern section of the front in Tunis and lure more enemy troops from the fortifications on this line. It was assumed that the Second Corps would best be able to threaten the enemy by first occupying East Dorsal and then advancing along the coastal plain 
if the Second Corps managed to get close enough to the coastal road on which the Germans were withdrawing to Tunis, then the enemy would have to throw on the threatened direction any forces to leave the way open. Alexander issued a directive for a diversionary offensive by the Second Corps on March 2. That is, four days before Patton arrived at Jebel Kaif. The Second Corps headquarters, anticipating such a maneuver, had already been working on an offensive plan for nearly two weeks. The Second Corps was to advance in three directions. The main forces of the Corps concentrated at Gafsa, broke through the mountain range at El Geta, and moved along the coastal road to Gabes. The Gafsa Gabes road led directly to the rear of the enemy defensive positions on the Marit line. This road was a highly important communication link, and the enemy would not dare to leave it uncovered before the threat of an Allied strike. Other American units were to threaten enemy communications further north, advancing from the pass behind McNassie, where the single-track railroad ran through Dorsal to the Mediterranean coast. The rest of the corps covered our northern flank, in order to prevent the danger of a flank attack which might prevent the corps from accomplishing its mission. However, no one intended to turn this blow into a breakthrough through Dorsal with access to the coast. The corps had neither the strength nor the means to do so. If we overstretched our units from Gafsa to Gabsa, the enemy counterattacks from the flanks could cause us serious losses. Patton was ordered to simply divert enemy forces to the front of the Second Corps, while Montgomery was making a decisive blow to the Marit line. The terrain in the area of Gafsa, where we were to carry out a demonstrative offensive, was unfavourable for the action of tanks. On both sides of the road to Gabes, on which Patton was to advance, towered steep, rocky mountains. It had been centuries since these mountains had been stripped of all vegetation, but they made excellent redoubts for enemy infantry and anti-tank artillery, which were camouflaged in the folds of the terrain. No one had tried to control soil erosion in the valley for hundreds of years, and the entire valley was riddled with impassable ravines. Small areas of terrain where nature had not created sufficiently strong barriers. The enemy had carefully dotted with anti-tank mud. Shortly after his arrival, Patton called division commanders together for a meeting at Jebel Kuif to discuss a plan of attack on Gafsa. Terry Allen's 1st Infantry Division, supported by the 1st Rangers Battalion, was to capture Gafsa and move east through the mountain corridor at El Geta on the road to Gabes. After the fall of Gafsa, the 1st Armoured Division with an attached infantry regiment of the 9th Division was to take possession of the area it had left behind in the battle at Kasserine Pass clear the passage at Maknasi from the enemy and threaten the coastal valley. The 34th Division, together with the rest of the 9th Division, was to hold the defence in the north. In the final phase, the 9th Division would move south to assist the 1st Division when it stirred up a hornet's nest in the mountains beyond El Geta. A month later, some commentators describing this campaign in southern Tunisia grumbled about the seeming failure of American troops to break through to the sea and rear the African corps on the Marat line. This is an undeserved criticism, for although Patton was to make demonstrative attacks toward Marat, he could not risk going that far. Alexander's directive specifically stated that the advance of large forces beyond the east dorsal was not authorised. Patton may have harboured hopes of an Allied breakthrough of the front, but the disposition of his own forces was not designed for it. If he had been given the task of breaking through to the sea, he could have accomplished it by breaking through Meknasi rather than through the mountains at El Getar. Yet it was at El Getar that Patton struck the main blow. In both North Africa and Sicily, Patton was strikingly indifferent to supply problems. He was a skillful tactician, but he lacked the patience to supervise the rear guard. He usually relegated supply issues to the background, considering them secondary, not worthy of his attention. Fortunately, in South Tunisia, the rear area was well established long before Patton arrived in the Second Corps. The supplies accumulated at Tebessa were sufficient to support Patton's diversionary offensive. Thoreau O. Wilson, given free rein in supply planning, began to rapidly inflate the requisitions for supplies needed for his section of the front. Later in Sicily, Patton found himself without Wilson to advise him on rear area arrangements and he began to experience such supply difficulties that he was forced to enlist the aid of the Second Corps. As a result, as far as material was concerned, the Second Corps took over such functions as were rather more suited to the army. Having experienced this in Sicily, Patton landed in Europe with the full realisation that supply difficulties might have limited the scope of his operations. Patton's offensive began on the night of March 1617, 
the first division entered Gafsa, recapturing this French outpost, abandoned only a month earlier during a German counterattack at the Kasserine Pass. Shortly before the division's advance, the Italians withdrew along the road to Gabes to the heights behind the El Ghetto Oasis with its date palms. Here, German reinforcements joined them and a line of defence was established to cover the rear of the African Corps. The evening before the offensive on Gafsa, George assembled the Second Corps part headquarters for a final briefing. Gentlemen, he said, looking around in the poorly lit room, tomorrow we attack. If we don't win, may none of us return alive. George then excused himself and went into the next room to pray alone. Such contradictions in George's character continued to baffle his staff. He was both a blasphemer and a believer. His subordinates would tremble before him, while he himself would humbly kneel before an And if this last call for victory, even at the cost of death in the eyes of the staff, seemed to be a theatrical gesture, nevertheless it became clear to them that for Patton the war was a holy crusade. However, could not get used to the vulgarity that Patton allowed himself, pouncing on his subordinates for relatively minor breaches of discipline. Patton considered profanity to be the best means of communicating with soldiers, while some were delighted when he used his famous profanities with marvellous originality. Most people, in my opinion, felt rather shocked and offended. Sometimes I thought that Patton, who commanded the course perfectly, had not learned to command himself. The technique of command, of course, depends on the personal qualities of the commander. While some prefer to lead by tact, personal example, and other methods of persuasion, Patton chose a different way to command his subordinates. He adopted a pompous appearance and made threats. His antics had noticeable results. But they were not calculated to win respect among officers and soldiers. While Patton was preparing to attack Gafsa, I visited Eisenhower's headquarters in Algiers. Eisenhower had just exchanged telegrams with General Marshall regarding the plan for the invasion of Sicily. Planning for this operation, which would provide a bridge across the Mediterranean Sea, had begun in January when a task force was set up at Allied headquarters in Africa to develop a plan for the invasion and to determine the resources required. Patton's 1st Armoured Corps was already slated to participate in the invasion of Sicily. Detailed development of the invasion plan began at 1st Corps headquarters in Rabat even before Patton left for the 2nd Corps. It was assumed that Patton would again command the 1st Armoured Corps after the Tunisia campaign. Ike asked me if it was advisable for Patton to remain with the 2nd Corps for the remainder of the Tunisia campaign, or if it would be better for him to return to the 1st Armoured Corps to continue planning for the invasion of Sicily, which would begin at the conclusion of the Southern Tunisia campaign. If Patton stayed with the 2nd Corps, then I would have to go to the 1st Armoured Corps and temporarily fulfil his duties in developing a plan for the invasion of Sicily. I think George should go back, I said, and resume planning the invasion operation in Sicily. After all, after all, he picked up the headquarters of the 1st Armoured Corps. He can get much more out of it than I can. And I think so, replied Ike. When the fighting for Gafsa is over, you will take command of the 2nd Corps and George will return to Rabat. I have already made arrangements with General Marshall. My appointment was carefully concealed until Patton left the corps. Publication in the press was delayed by the censors until after the Allies had occupied Bizerre. It is clear that the publication of information about the transfer of Patton from the Tunisian front would make the enemy think about the direction of the next Allied strike. Meanwhile, Ike did not want to disclose our further intentions in the Mediterranean Sea, March 20 at 22 hours. 30 men. After almost a month of preparation, Montgomery went on the offensive against the line Marit. The main defensive strip of the enemy stretched across the 32-kilometer throat between the mountains fringing the desert and the Mediterranean Sea. From the rear, the enemy was covered from a possible attack of the Second Corps by a long and impassable dry lake. As at El Alamein, Montgomery had prepared meticulously. Deftly organizing the offensive, Montgomery concentrated four divisions against the enemy's main defensive line. Engaged in battle on this line, he sent a mobile New Zealand corps to bypass the impassable flank of the defences of the line Marit, built by the French. As the enemy front shook in the face of this unexpected threat from the flank, Montgomery brought the 8th Army into the breach and began pursuing the enemy northward along the Tunisian coast. As Patton advanced beyond Gafsa to El Gitar, and the pass that led through this mountain trap into the valley and to Gabes.
enemy resistance increased. The Germans sought at all costs to prevent the Allies from reaching their rear and communications. As a result, the enemy had no choice but to withdraw troops from the Southern Front, where the fighting with Monty, and move them to the flank to stop Patton's diversionary advance. Patton's tanks could not pass through the valleys until the neighbouring heights were cleared of the enemy. He therefore sent the 1st Division to the left of the Gabe's Road and the 9th Division to the right. They were to clear the enemy from the heights and deprive him of artillery observation points. It soon became clear that this is an extremely difficult task, as the Americans had to fight for the rocky slopes of the heights to linger at every boulder, to conduct a firefight in every ravine. In short, had to deal with a stubborn and determined enemy. The enemy could not tolerate interference on his flank, when there was fighting not for life but for death on the Marat line. March 23, he went on the counterattack, seeking to push Patton back. The counterattack involved tanks, transferred from the main front. The offensive began at B o'clock in the morning, just when the red disk rising in the east of the sun blinded our artillery observers. German tanks T2 and T4 crawled along the valley taking cover in the ravines. They were supported by infantry and obsolete dive bombers U87. Although the enemy's advanced units managed to cut into our positions, the offensive was halted by nine. From the intercepted radio order of the Germans, the Allies learned that the German command intended to resume the offensive at 16 hours. Then a new order was intercept. The offensive was postponed until 16, 40 men. This time our troops were at the ready. When long chains of German infantry moved across the valley, our artillery let them up at close range. Then a hail of shells rained down upon them. General Patton, at the 1st Infantry Division observation post, shook his head as the infantry chains first thinned and then staggered. They are ruining fine infantry, he said. What a diabolical way to waste good infantry units. Eventually the enemy ceased the advance and withdrew, leaving 32 burned-out tanks on the battlefield. Apparently he was misled, as we had hoped, by our diversionary offensive along the Guffs of Gabe's Road. Fearing a breakthrough in this direction, the Germans tried to prevent it, and as a result Montgomery was able to develop the offensive. The Second Corps was indebted to Monty for undertaking a diversionary offensive during the fighting for the Kasserine Pass. Now Patton repaid him in full by pulling back the tanks of the African Corps. While Montgomery's Eighth Army was advancing across the coastal plain toward Tunisia, Alexander's 18th Army Group finalised plans for the next phase of the Tunisia campaign. As early as March 19, Patton had received orders to transfer the 9th Division to Commander Anderson's 1st Army to be used in the north on the British left flank in the attack on Bizerti. The transfer of the division was to be completed by the time of the breakthrough of the Merritt Line and the retreat of the enemy north of the road Gafsa. The remaining compounds and parts of the 2nd Corps were advancing on Fondoak in the gap between the 1st and 8th British armies. Again, we were to strike a demonstrative blow in the flank and rear of the retreating enemy. To fulfil this plan was sufficient to turn the 2nd Corps from Gafsa to the... The received directive threw me into confusion. From it, it was clear that the 2nd Corps would be deprived of the opportunity to contribute to the final victorious campaign. The fact is that while the 8th British Army was driving the Nazi troops into the last corner in Tunisia, Anderson was striking from the west and destroying the enemy. When the two British armies converged, closing the ring of encirclement around Arnim's troops, the Second Corps was pushed from the front in the area of Fondoc. Thus, having played a supporting role in the beginning of the Tunisian campaign, the only American combat unit in all of North Africa was deprived of the opportunity to contribute what it could to the final battle. I made Patton aware of my objections to such a plan, and he in turn was infuriated. With Patton's permission, I hurried to Hydra, where the headquarters of Alexander's army group had pitched its tents near the ancient winter camp of the Roman legionaries. There up, I was told that they had not the slightest intention of treacherizing us. The plan was drawn up based on the considerations of the rear workers, who believed that it would be impossible for Alexander to ensure the supply of the second corps on the existing roads on this section of the front in northern Tunisia. Despite these arguments from Alexander's headquarters, on my return to Gafsa, I reported to Patton my three main objections to the British plan. First, the proposal to exclude the Second Corps was unwise for tactical reasons, for in a final assault on the huddled enemy units in front of Tunis, Alexander, by pushing the Second Corps back, 
would most foolishly deprive himself of the support of an entire American corps of three full-blooded divisions. I did not believe he could afford such a luxury. Second, the transfer of the 9th American Division to the North meant that our troops again began to be dismembered into separate units and indiscriminately attached to any Allied group of troops. In practice, this created not only the danger of misusing American troops, but also violated the long-established principle that American troops should fight under American command. Third, I believed that the Americans had earned the right to share in the victory by fighting under their own flag. To deprive our troops of the opportunity to contribute to the final defeat of the enemy was to deprive them of their only reward for the hard months spent under fire. In my opinion, this course of action could not help but deteriorate the friendly relations between our troops. I could not believe that Eisenhower knew of Alexander's plan or that he approved of it. With Spon's permission, I flew to Algeria to present my objections to Eisenhower. As Allied commander in the Mediterranean, Eisenhower tried to be impartial to ward off British reproaches of pro-American sympathies. His command was a test of Allied unity under combat conditions, and any misstep would surely have destroyed the effectiveness of Eisenhower's leadership. As a result of Eisenhower's great caution, some Americans were inclined to believe that he was taking too pro-Anglo position. It would be unwise to deny that strong national differences sometimes brought discord between the British and American commands. These differences existed throughout World War II C and will always arise in any joint action where troops are united under a single Allied command. At the beginning of the war in North Africa, some British officers, especially the higher officers, treated the American army with poorly disguised derision. With their extensive military experience, they looked upon the Americans as provincials who understood nothing of the complex art of warfare. They readily recognized the qualitative superiority of American weaponry, but mocked us saying that we have too much of everything. In fact, there were not many British troops in Anderson's First Army who had more combat experience than the troops of the Second U.S. Corps. If they looked down on us, the veterans of the Eighth Army looked down on them with no small amount of arrogance. In turn, many Americans regarded the British with undisguised suspicion, as if trying to see the insidious hand of Britain in any Allied decision. Indeed, not only were many Americans instinctively anti-British, they reacted very painfully to covert jabs by the British that hurt American prestige and national pride. Most British soldiers respected the abilities of their American comrades in arms and frankly envied the equipment of our units. Even the most sceptical British staff officer soon learned to respect the work of American staffs and the amazing achievements of the American logistics. At the same time, American commanders at the front marveled at the tremendous endurance and courage of neighboring British units. In Tunisia, we were still just getting used to each other. The suspicion and envy that divided us took root mainly in the headquarters. The closer to the front line, the friendlier our relations were. Eisenhower was not yet familiar with Alexander's plan, which suspended the Second Corps from participating in the offensive at Funduk. He listened carefully to my explanation. The people in the United States expect victory, I explained, and they deserve it. The Americans played a big role in the invasion of North Africa and the beginning of the Tunisia campaign, and it would be hard for them to understand why American troops were excluded from the last battle. You may be right, Brad, he replied, surprised at the question. I hadn't thought about it. The war will last a long time, like, there will be a lot more Americans involved than there are now. I think we have a right to have our own commanders. We've had enough of being reassigned from one ally to another. Until you give us the opportunity to show what we can do on our own side of the front line, doing our job and having our own commanders in charge, you will never know whether we are fighting well or not, and neither will the American people. No. So what are you suggesting? I cast. I went to the map hanging on the wall. Move the Second Corps north as a whole, I said, not just the Ninth Division. Then authorize us to advance on Bizert. Ike frowned for a moment, looking at the map. Then, after making sure we could rockade roads through the British communications, he called Alexander. The Army Group commander was asked to assign the Second Corps a strip and set the task in conducting the closing offensive. All American divisions, Eisenhower said, should be under American command. The modest diversionary task assigned to Patton, an offensive along the Gafsa Gabes Road, only whetted his appetite, and he became anxious to take a more active part in the campaign in southern Tunisia.
he became increasingly irritated at the thought of having to dislodge the enemy from the heights near El Guetar by diverting enemy forces from Munti's front. As the 8th Army advanced northward from the Marit line, Patton's impatience increased. By the end of March it had turned to desperation. He hurriedly rushed at the behest of Eisenhower in Tunisia, but he had to fight only with those German troops that the Germans could without much damage to themselves to transfer from the front of Montgomery. Such a role could hardly suit a man burning with the desire to give a real fight. On March 25, Alexander ordered Patton to send tanks through the battle lines of the 1st and 9th Infantry Divisions and strike toward Gabes. Patton eagerly formed a tank group, setting it the task of making its way to the sea. The order, however, required Patton to advance cautiously, clearing the uplands of enemy troops step by step before bringing the tanks into action. Patton's infantry had been fighting over the mountain ranges for more than a week. Advancement was slow, it was exhausting and costly. The enemy had fortified himself on the heights from which the road could be seen, and from these fortified positions inflicted heavy losses on the advancing American troops. The battle for El Guitar became a scramble for the mountain ranges, and the advance of the corps became dependent upon the advance of individual patrols. For before Patton could use his tanks in the valley, the infantry had to dislodge the enemy from neighbouring heights. To delay Patton's tanks, the enemy covered his escape route with pie-shaped teller anti-tank mines. Here in the valley, the anti-tank mines could be used with as much effect as in Libya. Not content with this, the enemy dotted his positions with anti-personnel mines of tension and pressure action. The most dangerous anti-personnel mines our soldiers had already nicknamed Bouncing Betty. This mine was a small metal box about the size of a peach tin filled with steel shrapnel. The mine was buried in the ground with only the three tendrils of the detonator left on the surface, which was triggered when the infantryman touched a tendril with his foot or caught it on a specially strung wire. The mine jumped a little more than a metre into the air and exploded with a loud bang. The shrapnel flew at a distance of up to 15 metres. The tank group created by Patton to break through the heights behind El Guitar was commanded by Colonel Clarence Benson of the 1st Armoured Division. Benson's tank group, as it became known, consisted primarily of tanks and half-tracked armoured personnel carriers. It was mobile, fast-moving, and possessed powerful automatic fire. For three days Benson's group fought in the valley behind El Guetta, and all three days it rolled back, leaving behind burning tanks. Until the enemy was not knocked out of the heights, Benson could not overcome the anti-tank defences. Patton, stumped by the repeated failures of the tankers, asked me to go to the group. I was to make sure on the spot that the failures were not the result of Benson's lack of proper persistence and assertiveness. On a warm, sunny day in early spring, I left in a jeep from our headquarters, housed in the gendarmerie building in Gafsa, heading for El Guetar with its date palms. We drove past shabby Arab huts, making our way through a stream of trucks and ambulances toward the front. At last we reached the back slope of the open heights where the vehicles of Benson's command post were concentrated. In all, there were a dozen tanks and tracked armoured personnel carriers assembled on the bare slope. Slots dug into the hard, brown earth were blackened all around. A pair of self-propelled 37mm Beforce anti-aircraft guns were stationed here in case of an air raid. After each of Benson's attacks to break through on the road to Gabes, the Germans became increasingly wary of this section of the front. German air raids became more frequent. U87 bombers were scouting our artillery positions and vehicle concentrations, and Mi-109 and Fuck Wolf 190 fighters were making rapid assault raids. I was standing by a half-trekked armoured personnel carrier with Brigadier Charles Dunphy, a British liaison officer assigned to the 2nd Corps. We were studying from the map the battle plan of Benson's group. Suddenly three shrill whistles sounded, warning of an air raid. Squinting against the morning sun, I saw in the air 12 twin-engine bombers approaching our positions at an altitude of about 2,500 metres. We did not open fire, hoping that the German pilots would not notice us, so the planes flew past. Dunphy and I continued to study the situation. A few minutes later, the whistle blew again. Bombers circled above us, having spotted us. The anti-aircraft guns opened fire, and we took cover in a gap. The ground heaved beneath us as the bombs hit our positions. The shockwave tore off our helmets and covered us with sand. A few seconds later, fragmentation bombs were dropped on the command post. When I crawled out of the gap, Dunphy was bleeding. He was wounded in the thigh. 
I stopped the bleeding by applying a tourniquet to his thigh and gave Dunphy my sulfadine tablets. Bridge tore a piece off his shirt and bandaged the bleeding wound in his shoulder. Some of the bombs fell between two slits. In one was Hansen. In the second was Patton's adjutant, Captain Richard Jackson. Jackson was killed. A shattered watch was lying nearby. The driver of the jeep disappeared without a trace, apparently as the result of a direct hit. By the time the ambulances arrived, enemy artillery had located our position. As we hurried to prepare the wounded for evacuation, the first ambulance was wrecked. My jeep, riddled with shrapnel, had two tyres damaged. In the afternoon, Hansen delivered Jensen's body to Gufsa in his jeep. Patton immediately got in his car and drove to a small French cemetery on the European side of town. There lay two dozen dead men wrapped in blankets and prepared for burial. Patton knelt by Jensen's body, tears rolling down his cheeks. He pulled a small pair of scissors from his pocket and cut off a strand of hair to send to Jensen's mother. He put the strand in his wallet and drove back through town in silence. That same day, Patton gave a radiogram to British Air Support Commander Cunningham complaining about the lack of interception by Allied fighters of German planes on our front. We were both concerned about the demoralising effect of enemy aircraft on our troops. Noting the enemy's activity in the air that day, the Operations Department of the 2nd Corps Headquarters reported in a report dated April 1. Forward units all morning were subjected to prolonged bombardment from the air. The complete absence of air cover for our troops gave the German aircraft the opportunity to operate almost unimpeded. The enemy aircraft bombed the command posts of all divisions and concentrated their efforts against the units striking the main blow. Tactical Aviation Commander Cunningham's response to Patton was sharp. Questioning the accuracy of the 2nd Corps report, Cunningham radioed Patton. I do not think you intend to force American air commanders to engage only in defence. It seems to me that you want to resort to the discredited practice of citing aviation as an excuse for lack of success on the ground. If your report is objective and corresponds to reality, then it remains only to assume that the personnel of the Second Corps in question does not meet the requirements of modern combat. In view of the excellent and successful performance of American aviation, please put an end to sending us such inaccurate and exaggerated reports. The 12th Air Support Command has been instructed to disregard unsubstantiated calls for air support, which may lead to a reduction in the effectiveness of air support to the Second Corps. Cunningham further complicated matters by sending copies of this radiogram to all senior officers in the Mediterranean theatre of operations. As soon as Patton received Cunningham's telegram, he rushed to the telephone and called Algiers. Eisenhower attempted to calm Patton, outraged to the core, by promising that Cunningham would apologise to the Second Corps. Apology, however, was a short 27-word telegram addressed to all commanders, stating that Cunningham's earlier telegram should be considered null and void. Patton, unwilling to forgive or forget the offence, wrote Eisenhower a detailed letter. According to Patton, he was outraged that Cunningham's apology to the American troops, many of whom had marched and fought under difficult conditions since March 17, was wholly unsatisfactory. To ensure that the incident would not affect the future work of the Allied command, Eisenhower ordered Cunningham to come to the Corps and personally apologise to Patton. Then, to exhaust the matter, Cunningham radioed the matter to all officers to whom copies of his first telegram had been sent. The misunderstanding had occurred, he explained in the telegram, because of a transmission error. Instead of transmitting some corps personnel, it was transmitted personnel of the second corps. Fortunately, such episodes were rare, but they indicate the morbid ego of some allied commanders, between whom deep contradictions could arise over trifles. Eisenhower took no further disciplinary action against Cunningham. On April 3, to see that reconciliation was finalised, Air Chief Marshal Tedder arrived at Gafsa with Toy Speyats. They were to discuss improving cover and support for ground troops by Allied air power. We gathered in a small room of the Gendarmerie building. Early had Tedder had time to say that Allied aviation dominates the Mediterranean theatre of operations, as a quartet of Focky Wilm Run 90s swept over the city. The planes bombarded the streets of Gafsa from a strafing flight, past our house rushed a camel caravan turned in panic flight. At the end of the raid, the planes dropped bombs. Plaster fell from the ceiling, and we tried to open the door, but it was jammed shut. Tedder piped up, looked sly, and smiled. Toy looked out the window. He turned to Patton 
Damn it as soon as you work. Now I'll be damned if I know, George shouted. But if I could find out what sons of bitches were flying those planes, I'd award them medals. Further north at McNaxie, where Ward was also conducting a diversionary offensive, his first armoured division reached a pass into the coastal plain. But here the enemy, entrenched on the slopes, halted the division's further advance. Alexander suggested to Patton to make a small raid by tanks against the German airfield, located 16 kilometres beyond this passage by the railroad leading to the coast. Ward made every effort to break through, but each time the enemy repulsed the attacks of his tanks. Patton, irritated by the failures, accused Ward of indecision in accomplishing the task at hand. However, this hasty judgment was hardly borne out by the situation at McNassie. Ward's failures were not at all due to a lack of will to attack. Before sending tanks through the passage, he had to first master the mountainsides, and this required more infantry than Patton had put at his disposal to accomplish the task. The key to the entire position was one height, and Patton eagerly awaited Ward's report of its capture. When no such message arrived until March 23, Patton called Ward's command post, stationed near the abandoned railroad station at McNassie. Me, Pink, have you not yet taken that high ground? He asked and paused briefly. I don't want that damned apology. I want you to go out there and take the high ground yourself. It's up to you to lead the attack. Don't come back until the high ground is taken. Ward put on a helmet, took a carbine and went to lead the night assault. Once again the infantry stormed the heights, this time led by Ward. Again the enemy did not budge, repulsing the attack. Ward returned at dawn, wounded in the eye. Patton's patience was now exhausted. He summoned Major General Ernst Garman of the 2nd Armoured Division from Morocco to take command of Ward's division. Patton could not, however, tell Ward himself that he had deposed him. One morning at breakfast, shortly before Harmon arrived, Patton put it to me. Listen, Brad, he said, you're a friend of Pinky Ward's. Go to him and tell him why I've decided to relieve him of his post. The news I brought did not surprise Ward. He had been expecting it any minute, for he was convinced that Patton did not understand the peculiarities of the situation in his section. In this case, I would not have removed Ward from his post, but during the war in Europe it happened that I removed commanders for insufficient offensive tempo. Perhaps some of these commanders were victims of the circumstances. Indeed, how can one person be blamed for failure when there are so many factors affecting the outcome of any battle? Nevertheless, every commander must take full responsibility for all subordinates. If battalion or regimental commanders fail him during an offensive, then he must either remove them or be removed himself. Many division commanders failed not because they lacked the ability to command, but because they were not demanding enough of their subordinates. After all, raising the issue of removal is sometimes imperative. Although I did not agree with Ward's removal, the relationship between him and Patton had deteriorated so badly that it was better to break it off than to try to improve it in any way. Ward returned to the United States where in June 1943 he took over the Fighter Anti-Tank Artillery Training Center at Camp Hood. In January 1945, he was again overseas, becoming commander of the 20th Armored Division. Early on the morning of April 6, Montgomery's troops launched an offensive on the coastal plain, this time to dislodge the enemy from the dry bed of the Wadier Carrot, a defensive line occupied by the enemy after the withdrawal from the Murret Line. The Gurkhas, armed with large curved knives, were the first to infiltrate the enemy position, and at dawn concentrated artillery, fire heralded the last offensive against the fascist forces in southern Tunisia. As with the capture of Wadi Akarite, a wide road opened up to Enfideville, lying in the mountains south of Tunis. April 7. Alexander informed Patton that the moment had come to give full support to the 8th. George was to move into a rapid offensive along the road to Gabes hit the flank of the retreating Germans and joining Montgomery's troops to close the ring of encirclement. At nine o'clock, 30 minutes, morning of the same day, he ordered Benson to carry the hurricane to the coast of the Mediterranean Sea or until he faced the enemy, retreating under the blows of Montgomery. In seven hours, Benson's tanks deepened 32 kilometers behind the 8th Army's boundary line and at 16 hours. 10 min. Allied troops advancing from the east and west met. Alexander's pincers closed around the enemy in Tunisia. The Allied forces now formed a united front for a decisive offensive against the combined forces of von Arnim and... A few days before this encounter, 
Alexander had created another threat to the enemy's flank and rear. The Allies were to advance through the holy city of Carion and along the road to Susi, located on the sea, with the task of cutting off the enemy's escape routes to the north. But in order to reach Caruan, it was necessary first to break through the dorsal at Fonduk. For this purpose, a corps was formed under the command of British Lieutenant General John Crocker. Crocker rejected Ryder's plan, which proposed to conduct a diversionary manoeuvre and encircle the enemy's main defensive line. Instead, he called for overcoming the enemy's positions with a frontal assault. As a result, the 34th Division was thrown back with heavy losses at the outset of the attack, and the British suffered heavily as they attempted to break through the pass. Croker eventually captured Fonduk and rushed toward Kairouan, but by then the enemy had already withdrawn north of Susi's to heights near Amphideville. Croker, annoyed that the enemy had slipped away, lost his temper and lashed out at the 34th Division, blaming it for his failure. Ryder vigorously denied Crocker's accusations of inexperience and excessive caution. The offensive had failed, Ryder argued, mainly because of Crocker's misguided actions. Ryder had a reputation as an excellent tactician, and so I sided with him. However, as a result of Crocker's outburst of anger, the 34th Division was blacklisted by Alexander's Army Group headquarters, and a proposal was made to take the division to the rear for additional training. Prior to this, it had been planned at the 34th Division, in conjunction with 9th Division to participate in the 2nd Corps' offensive on B. When I learned of the British plan to withdraw the 34th Division for humiliating training, I warned Patton that leaving the front would discourage the division's personnel and undermine its morale. The 34th Division was no better or worse than any other division in the 2nd Corps. It only needed confidence, the confidence that is created only by winning a battle and annihilating the Germans. Only Ryder should set a feasible task. Hmm, I said to Patton. Yes, that one will no longer worry about the 34th Division. If Alexander gives me this division to participate in our offensive in the north, I guarantee him that it will fight beautifully. With George's agreement, I flew out to Alexander's headquarters at Hydra. Alexander was as upset as we were about Crocker and Ryder's mutual accusations. Not only did he want to set the matter right, but himself a former division commander, he immediately understood what I meant when I spoke of the need to build confidence in a fighting unit. However, my staff believes that the 34th Division needs additional training, he said. Give me this division, I asked. Aye, and I promise that it will capture and hold the first specified boundary. It will do so even if I had to support the division with the fire of the entire corps artillery. Alexander laughed. We take her, he said. She is yours. At first it was assumed that after the transfer of the second corps to the north on a section of the front of 60 kilometers will be used two and a half divisions. The front line stretched from the Beja Road junction through the valley of the Sejanan River to the northern coast. This front was defended by one British infantry division and two brigades. Alexander's staff believed that the capacity of the roads in this area would not allow the use of more than two and a half divisions during the offensive. The 1st and 9th Infantry Divisions and half of the 1st Armoured Division were to advance. By adding the 34th Division to these forces, we increased the number of infantry half and thus greatly strengthened the striking power of the corps. However, when Alexander informed the Chief of Supply of the Army Group of his decision to give us the 34th Division, the latter frowned. I must remind you, sir, he said, turning to Alexander, that on this front cannot be provided with material for another division, because the capacity of roads is insufficient. Alexander looked at me. Give us a division, and we will provide it, me, I said, as I was sure that we can exceed the calculations of the British at least 50%. Wilson proved that my calculations were too moderate. We not only exceeded the British plans for material support, we doubled them. By April 10, the Second Corps was already moving to the Northern Front, 320 kilometers away from the British Army's supply line. There was a festive mood in Gafsa as tanned, slimmed down, and invigorated American soldiers returned from El Ghetta. Camel caravans were making way for columns of vehicles, carrying tens of thousands of soldiers to the Northern Front, where they were to pursue the enemy to the last remaining ports in his hands. During the 25 days of the campaign in Southern Tunisia, our losses totaled 5,893, including 794 killed.
In his final report on the fighting, Patton refrained from determining enemy losses. The intelligence division had previously reported that enemy troops numbering 20,000 occupied the corridor at Il Gutar and another 10,000 held the passage at Maknasi. In addition, 7,000 men were scattered across the entire front of the Second Corps. From this grouping of mostly first-class enemy troops, totaling 37,000 men, 4,680 were taken prisoner, of whom 4,200 were Italians. In all, 110,000 American troops and 30,000 vehicles of various types were moved into Africa against Bizert. Judging by the fact that the enemy was caught by surprise in the north, the transfer of troops went unnoticed. A complex maneuver was developed by the operational department of the headquarters of the Second Corps. It required not only the preparation of a complex schedule, taking into account the cross-movement of vehicles with cargo, but also to determine the order of the change of British units, which occupied before our arrival, allocated to us a section of the front. More to the point, the maneuver entailed not only the transfer of vehicles and men, but also the relocation of our huge supply base from Tebessa to Bija. During the fighting at El Geta, more than 1,000 tons of supplies, mostly ammunition, were transported daily by road from Tebessa to the front. After the completion of this phase of the campaign, Patton was to take command of the first armoured corps again, in which the preparation of the plan for the invasion of Sicily entered a decisive stage. The first armoured corps during the invasion deployed to the 7th American Army. However, this action was to be carried out only when the ships with troops went to sea. Meanwhile, Mark Clark's staff was to develop a plan for the invasion of the 5th Army in the Salerno area. On the evening before leaving Gavsar for Rabat, Patton informed us of the preparations for the invasion of Sicily. Major General Ernst Dowley's 6th Corps, which had just landed in Africa, was to make up the first echelon of Patton's army invasion force. Bradley, said Patton, how would you feel about taking command of the 2nd Corps and joining me in the Sicily campaign? Instead of Dowley? I asked. He nodded his head. I work together with you and trust you. On the other hand, I don't know what the hell Dowley is capable of. If you don't mind, I'll make arrangements with Ike. A few days later, Eisenhower granted Patton's request, and in the first echelon of the invasion of Sicily, instead of the 6th Corps, was assigned to the 2nd Corps. Dowley was placed at the disposal of Clark's 5th Army to participate in the landing in the Salerno area. On April 15, Patton loaded his headquarters onto motor cars and headed for the long return trip to Rabat. At midnight, I went from deputy commander of the 2nd Corps to commander. The appointment was kept secret, and I did not dare to write to my wife about the promotion. By this time, the Nazi troops were driven into the last remaining corner in their hands in Tunisia, but they preferred to continue the costly struggle for time, expecting to shackle our forces in the Mediterranean and thus prevent the organization of the summer campaign in some other area. Persistent rumors circulated about the evacuation of German generals, but still German reinforcements continued to arrive in Tunisia. The remaining German transport planes were dropping reinforcements every day from Sicily to the last bridgehead of the Axis forces. Large formations of aircraft Du-52 under cover of fighters, at the risk of interception by Allied aircraft, continued the transfer of troops. In desperation, the Germans even used huge six-engine transport planes Merseburg. These were slow-moving and clumsy machines, but for each flight such an airplane carried 120 people. Outdated French engines installed on these machines did not allow to develop a speed of more than 225 kilometers per hour, so the aircraft became easy prey to Allied fighters. Although Alexander cornered the enemy with a significant superiority and strength, the rugged terrain in Tunisia partially negated this advantage. Nature covered the valley that stretched to the ports of Bizerti and Tunis with a mountain wall. The heights near Amphideville on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean were a stone barrier blocking the path of Montgomery's 8th Army. To Montgomery's left, three poorly equipped divisions of the French 19th Corps, under General Louis-Marie Coels, attempted to attack this barrier. Still to the left, where the front line turns north toward the Mediterranean. Anderson's 1st Army, consisting of four infantry and two armoured divisions, was preparing for a decisive offensive to overcome the mountains and reach the valley in front of Tunis. On the left flank of Anderson's army, the Second Corps now deployed one armoured and three infantry divisions along the mountain ridge beyond which was the scrubby valley of the Sejanan River, high above sea level. 
Each Allied headquarters gave a different estimate of enemy forces, but none of them gave a figure close to the 250,000 men we later captured. On April 14, the day before Patton's departure from the Second Corps, Alexander called a meeting at his Army Group headquarters at Hydra to discuss strategy for the final phase of the Tunisia campaign. Eisenhower flew in for the meeting from Algiers, and Anderson arrived from the First Army. Montgomery, as usual, did not show up. Alexander's chief of staff visited Montgomery a few days before the meeting and coordinated the Eighth Army's offensive from the Amphitaville area with the Allied offensive from the west. Alexander would concentrate his forces in the center, on the front of Anderson's army, and strike through Majez Elbab in the direction of Tunis. The troops of the First Army were to develop an offensive to the north and south. One column of British troops was heading north to assist the Second Corps in the capture of Bizert while the other cut off the enemy's retreat routes to Cape Bon. The main task of the 8th Army and the 2nd Corps in the offensive was not so much to occupy territory as to draw enemy forces from the front of Anderson's 1st Army. Consequently, the 2nd Corps was not tasked with capturing Byzerte with its own forces alone. Instead, it was to cover the left flank of Anderson's troops advancing on Tunisia and get into position for a joint offensive with the British on Bizert. No one, not even Alexander believed we could capture Bizete on our own. Although the Second Corps continued to remain in direct command of Alexander's 18th Army Group, Anderson sought the right to be responsible for organizing the interaction of the Second Corps with the... Although this meant that I would receive orders through Anderson rather than directly from Alexander, I did not object. I felt that since Anderson was delivering the main blow, he had a right to worry about securing his flanks. To avoid misunderstandings with Anderson's headquarters, however, Alexander suggested that I contact his headquarters directly at any time. I ought not, he said, to have been in full command of the British Army. Fortunately, I only once exercised the right granted. Meanwhile, in Washington, General Marshall was showing growing concern over the unflattering reports of American correspondents on the action at Gafsa. He drew Eisenhower's attention to criticism of the U.S. Command for the fact that the troops failed to and break through the front, go to the sea and cut off the enemy's escape routes to the north. General Marshall's letter emphasized the issue to which I drew Eisenhower's attention, that is, the moral significance of the upcoming operations in northern Tunisia. Two weeks before making the above point, I had feared that Eisenhower might interpret my actions as a desire to play a more prominent role in the closing campaign. Marshall's letter eliminated any possibility that Ike might misunderstand my motives. My fears were further dispelled when I received the following letter from Eisenhower on the eve of the campaign. The upcoming phase of the operation is particularly important to the American troops involved. There is no need to turn a blind eye to the fact that some disappointments have already befallen us. We must overcome these difficulties and prove to the world that the four American divisions, which are now at the front, will demonstrate the high quality of our weapons and the military skill of our commanders. By drawing the enemy's forces from Anderson's front to ourselves, and thus assisting him, we foresaw that in the advance on Bizert he would have to meet with greatly increased resistance. At first, at my disposal, was allocated only half of the 1st Armoured Division. The other half of the division was in the strip of Anderson's army. Then, under the pretext of assisting Anderson to unload the roads clogged with troops, I moved this half of the division to the section of my 2nd Corps. Thus, instead of two and a half American divisions, as the army group had originally planned, we now had a total of four divisions, of which three were on the front line and one in reserve. Having accumulated forces, we began to put forward broader plans. Concentration of the 1st Armoured Division in reserve in order to put it in the breakthrough most of all pleased Harmon. He was impatient to demonstrate the offensive impulse of his division. He had shown the same impatience when the British had delayed his advance north of Tibessa. Harmon arrived at Beja furious at the delayed advance, complaining fervently about the English habit of making sure to have an afternoon tea party. Turn the calm down, Ernie. I said to him the English are accustomed to have tea every day in peace and war, and they have done so for three hundred years. They'll do the same for another thousand years. You can't break that tradition. Next time they stop for a rest you stop and have tea with them. I stayed in Gafsa until the command post was relocated, and then, after driving all day in a jeep through the Tunisian valleys, covered at this time with a red carpet of poppies, I arrived in Bejar on the evening of April 15.
The command post was located in a small grove on the northeastern edge of the city. The tents stood so close one to the other that if the enemy had discovered our location from the air, he would have covered us with a single approach. I ordered the commandant to disperse the headquarters and move half the men up the hillside where Mayor Bajee's lovely farm nestled. We found out that the British had been here last winter. The garden in which we had pitched our tents was quite conveniently riddled with crevices from our tents which stood under flowering fig and rose trees. We could watch the flashes of the enemy's gun fire at the front. Veja, a clean French colonial town where the strategic roads leading to Tunis and Bizerta cross, stands on the site of an ancient Roman settlement once sacked by the Vandals. With the onset of the spring thaw, Typhus had ravaged the town's white plastered houses, and the bombed-out streets were mostly empty. Yellow signs labelled Typhus warned our troops of their impending danger. At the farm, the mayor and his wife invited us into their home. We did not, however, want to evict them, so we occupied only a storage room as an operating room. The other departments were housed in ordinary staff tents adapted for blackout conditions. The officers lived in tarpaulin tents made at Oriva, and the soldiers occupied the barn. Two days after the meeting at Hydra, Alexander issued a directive to his troops. Then, on April 18, Anderson called a meeting of corps commanders. We reported orally our considerations, after which Anderson issued an army order. The headquarters of the 1st British Army was on a farm near the Monastery Tiber, located on top of the mountain. General Crocker, commander of the British 9th Corps, Major General Ulfrey, commander of the British 5th Corps, and General Coles, commander of the French 19th Corps, were gathered there. We had all brought large maps with the situation plotted on them to use during the meeting. Unfortunately, Coles spoke no English at all. As he laid out his plan on the map, I tried to follow his train of thought using my meagre knowledge of French from West Point. When Carls apologised for not speaking English, Anderson cheered him up with a nonchalant look. Everyone here, of course, understands French. I didn't understand and suffered in silence. Although Bezerte was the final object of the Second Corps, Anderson considered the initial period of our offensive solely as an action that has a long way to divert enemy forces from the British troops making the main blow to Tunisia. In fact, the conditions of the terrain is not at all favourable to the rapid offensive of the Second Corps on Bizert. From Beja to Matera stretched a valley, which, as well as the corridor at El Geta, was squeezed by two parallel ridges of mountains. Further north our way was obstructed by strong positions at Jeffna, where the British had lost an infantry brigade last winter in a vain attempt to capture them. To the north on the Mediterranean coast, the valley of the Sejenan River was covered with almost impenetrable brushwood. Two main roads ran along this section of the front. The first in the north ran from Jebel Abyad through Jeffna to Marta. The other in the south ran along the edge of the Eltin River Valley from Beji to Marta. In addition to this, there were two other country roads. One ran along the valley of the Sejanon River towards Bizerte, while the other followed the Eltin River of the two main roads. The shorter one ran through Jeffna from Jebel Abyad to Matira, which was on the edge of the salt marsh plain that extended to Bizert. This road, however, ran through a narrow neck formed by the two heights of Green Hill and Bold Hill, on which were the positions that covered Jeffna. I knew that we could hardly succeed in breaking through this position by a frontal assault. Although the southern road along the Eltin River seemed more convenient, it would hardly be easier to advance along it. The British informed us that the Germans had fortified the mountains surrounding this road. Any attempt to break through with large forces in this direction would have been repulsed by anti-tank artillery fire. Dixon dubbed this road the Mouse Trap Valley, and the intelligence department draftsmen depicted the valley on tracing paper as a wide open trap. However, if you do not take into account the enemy's fortifications, the Valley Mouse Trap was so convenient for tank attack that it attracted the attention of Eisenhower. At 16, he wrote to me, The southern part of your sector seems to be suitable for tank action, and we expect you to strike here the main blow, at least in the initial period of the operation. Unfortunately, I did not have my intelligence on the enemy's anti-tank defences. This route, which seemed convenient, could not be used until we had cleared the enemy from the heights north and south of the valley. By the time of the meeting at Anderson's near Tibar, I had not yet been able to reconnoitre the terrain. As a result, I was forced to confine myself to studying the terrain by map alone. 
Bunsen had raised elevations on the map, and I spent many hours studying the relative tactical importance of positions on the heights. Heading to the meeting at Taibar on April 18, I mentally pictured the tactical significance of each important height in front of the Second Corps' front. From the outset it was evident that in the mountainous terrain it was necessary to act in view of its character. Bare heights dominated the treeless plains, and we could not advance until these elevations were captured, since a few large heights dominated the rest of the heights. It was clear that our main effort should be directed against these important positions. I therefore proposed to use infantry to seize the heights one by one, and to establish artillery observation posts at each captured height. Believing that when the whole chain of heights was in our hands, control of the valleys would be established automatically. At first glance, this way seemed slower, as we had to storm one height after another. However, based on Patton's experience of fighting at El Guetta, I was convinced that by methodically capturing these heights, we could eventually create the conditions for a successful tank offensive along the Valley Mousetrap and Occupy Mater. This course of action meant that the entire burden of the offensive would have fallen on the shoulders of the infantry until Harmon's tanks would have entered the passage made by the infantry. Although this meant that the soldiers would have to overcome great difficulties, there was no other choice if they wanted to reach Byzert. In the end, this decision proved to be the right one, and we saved many lives. Our actions were timed to coincide with the beginning of the British offensive on April 23, and so at first I could count on the use of only two American divisions. The other two divisions were still en route north. On April 19, I gave the order to the Second Corps for the offensive. It was a short document, taking up half a page, and it was accompanied by a tracing paper with the situation plotted. On the left flank, the 9th Infantry Division, leaving aside the highway that passed through the defile at Jeffna, was making its way through the brush in the valley of the Sejanon River. From here, Eddie could bypass the impregnable position at Jeffna and expose to artillery fire, the only road by which the enemy brought ammunition to the position. Consequently, he could force the enemy to pull back without stopping the advance on Bizert. On the right flank of the Second Corps was the 1st Infantry Division, which was assigned the task of clearing the Mousehole Valley from the enemy and advancing along it to the Chuiji Hills, where we were to join Anderson's troops for the advance on Bizert. I attached to Allen's division a regiment of motorized infantry from the 1st Armored Division. The regiment was to clear the enemy from the heights that bordered the Valley Mouse Trap from the south and to maintain contact with the British on the right flank. Harmon's tanks were in reserve at the entrance to the Valley Mouse Trap, waiting for our troops to ensure passage through the valley. Then the tank's rapid rush was to break through to Matera. Anderson realized that we will be difficult to move supply lines from Tibessa to another direction. Therefore, he proposed to postpone our offensive for one day and start it on April 24. One day's postponement, of course, would not seriously upset the offensive plan. However, I was determined, if it was practicable, to begin the offensive at the same time as the British. Everything depended on Wilson, who every morning at a staff meeting reported on the number of supplies delivered by truck the previous day to the front. Despite all the ingenuity of the rear department, the accumulation of supplies was painfully slow. To speed up the delivery of supplies, we established one-way traffic on the road, which was used to supply the front from the Mediterranean port of Tabarka. We withdrew from the divisions at the front-line vehicles, put two drivers on each car, made three-day trips without stopping. If the British made one trip a day in one direction, we had time to make a round trip in a day, and often made two full trips. In view of the danger of enemy air attack, Allied convoys of vehicles were forced to move slowly along the roads at night, observing the rules of light camouflage. The convoys actually crawled, and accidents were frequent on the steep climbs in the mountains. Bob, I said to Wilson one morning when it was clear from the figures, he had reported that we would not be able to meet the transportation plan by April 23. Let's forget the camouflage and let the trucks move at night with their headlights on. What about the enemy, sir? Bill Keane objected. We'll lose fewer vehicles to air attacks, I said, than if we drive without lights. Wilson agreed. That night, the convoys of vehicles travelled with lighted headlights, and soon the number of deliveries began to increase rapidly. It was not until midnight on April 20 that Wilson could assure me that we would complete the transportation plan in time for the beginning of the offensive. When he entered my tent, I was studying a trophy German map. We will accomplish our task, General, he said. You can confidently plan to start the offensive with the British on April 23? 
By this time, the forward echelon of the headquarters of the Second Corps had been reduced to a minimum size. We allowed all staff offices to attend the morning meetings so that each could familiarize himself with the considerations of the other officers. We pitched another small tent next to the large staff tent, and there at meal times I discussed operational plans with Keen and other senior staff officers. But almost immediately after assuming command of the Corps, I cancelled the breakfast time set by Patton and moved it to 8 o'clock. 30 a.m. This had an extremely favourable effect on the efficiency of the staff officers. In order to maintain secrecy in telephone conversations which the enemy might overhear, I coded on my map the most important heights, crossroads and settlements, and copies of this map were sent to division commanders. It was an improvised non-statutory code, and a fairly simple one at that, which made Dixon seriously worried about keeping our plans secret. One morning I called Alan, and in conversation he referred to a low-profile intersection, relaying its code name. Hmm, just a minute, Terry, I said. It's not on my map. Listen carefully, Brad, he said. There may be an enemy listening in. I'll tell you his unencoded name real quick. Dixon, who had overheard our conversation, spread his hands. Keeping the secret would not be so difficult, he remarked, if there were fewer generals in the army. Before the offensive began, I took a jeep tour of my division commanders and familiarized myself with the character of the terrain in front of their front. Manton Eddy's command post in the Sejanan River Valley was the second time I had visited. Here the military police who regulated traffic wore Arabian burqas to conceal the location of the command post from enemy aerial reconnaissance. In the corps right of way, between Eddy's section in the north and Terry Allen's section in the south, there remained a 15-kilometer gap unoccupied by troops. Although our reconnaissance units kept a watchful eye on this section of the front, Eddie admitted that he was greatly disturbed by this wide gap on his right flank. Manton, I assured him, no one is going to slip through that gap. As a last resort, Bill Keane and I with our rifles will stop anyone who tries to sneak through it. Eddie smiled, but his concern was not diminished. When he had expressed the fear that the enemy might send a battalion, or even a regiment across this bare stretch of front, I had to agree that such a possibility was not out of the question. But what can he do if he even penetrates here? I said, in this direction there is nothing but mountains and brushwood. There is not a single road. Even battalions won't advance far unless they have vehicles. We could not cover this gap between our troops without significantly weakening our units advancing on other parts of the front. I deliberately took the risk of leaving the gap uncovered. Manton's fears were in vain. The enemy did not make the slightest attempt to take advantage of this gap. He was too busy holding his front line. Terry Allen's battle-hardened infantrymen, with the big red number one on their sleeves at the shoulder, guarding the headquarters, were quartered in a barn yard, piled with heaps of steaming manure off the Bejamada Road. Here, more than anywhere else on the front line, the artificial liveliness concealed the tension that usually builds on the eve of an offensive. Although the 1st Division had suffered heavy losses, it was better manned than most of the other divisions. Unlike the other divisions, it was not stripped of manpower to train new recruits, as it was quickly dispatched from the United States. The enterprising nature of the men of the 1st Division could even be seen in Allen's mess hall, where the rough table was laden with appetizing roast beef, whereas in other divisions the commanders had to make do with ordinary canned food. Terry's meat was supplied by cattle that happened to come under enemy fire. Despite the veterinarian's warning that meat from diseased animals could be eaten, fresh meat appeared suspiciously often in the First Division's mess halls. Terry's black hair was disheveled, a hidden smile roaming across his face. He still wore the same dark green gymnospear and pants he had worn throughout the campaign in the Gafsa area. A resident had once ironed out the creases in his pants, but they had long since smoothed out, and now the pants hung baggy. The aluminum stars that Terry had attached to his epaulettes had been taken from an Italian soldier. Although Terry became a hero to his soldiers, he remained a white crow among the senior officers. He always fought to protect the 1st Division from the encroachments of higher authority. Terry was fanatically opposed to any superiors above the division level. As a result, he had a tendency to persevere and be independent. Sophisticated, erudite, and assertive, he often ignored orders and fought as he thought best. I found that Terry was hard to persuade to strike where I thought it was more appropriate. He would half-heartedly agree with the plan. But when the fighting started, somehow he would forget about it and do it he 
The Eighth Army Montgomery on the right flank of the front of the Allies had to break through the heights at Amphidavel to the coast three days before the beginning of the offensive Anderson in the West Alexander hoped that Montgomery will be able to pull the enemy forces from the front of Anderson, thereby facilitate the latter's attack on Tunisia, but hardened in battles in the desert troops Montgomery, reaching the heights at Amphidavel, found themselves in an unusual situation for them, and the attack was smothered. Meanwhile, the enemy on the front of Anderson felt the accumulation of British forces in this direction to Tunisia. Not waiting for the beginning of the offensive of the First Army, Arnim took the initiative in his own hands and launched a counter-attack on the 9th Corps Anderson forces of the Shock Division Hermann Goering, supported by Tiger's 10th Panzer Division. This counter-attack was intended to confuse the First Army's maps and win the Germans a few more days. The British held their ground and the Germans retreated losing the 33 tanks they so badly needed. Despite interference from Arnim, the British went on the offensive the next day as the plan called for.